All right, and we are live with Speak Up. This is Speak Up with Anthony Scaramucci. Uh, you can call us anytime, 92 the Mooch. But Matthew, Matt Higgins, best selling author, Shark Tank, uh, Judge. I think it's a judge, right? It's or, no, it's not judge. It's not judge. No, just call it a shark. Just call it a shark. All right. Uh, Miami Dolphins guru. He had a great, great season this year. Uh, who's going to win the Super Bowl? Uh, I love Dan Campbell. So I'm going to say Detroit. All right, but that, is that because you're a fan or is that your real Jimmy the Greek analysis of who's going to win the Super Bowl? Uh, it's it's none of the above. It's a, it's an emotional. It's an attempt to manifest something I would like to have happen emotionally. Is there a category for that? Okay, yeah, there's a category for that. There's <laughs> a category for everything that Matt Higgins does. <laughs> What's up, Mooch? Look, I'm thrilled to be here with you. This is Speak Up with Anthony Scaramucci. So, Matt, we know each other a long time. Okay, although I'm lying about my age now, so. You just turned 60. Yeah, I just turned 60. See that? You had to open up with that, right? You know, <laughs> I my, did. When you published well, birthday. People in my household that said, happy 27th birthday, I was very happy. When my mother-in-law was coming in with the balloons and it said a six and a no, I wasn't happy, okay? Very bad marketing from my mother-in-law. But, but we know each other a long time. You're a brilliant entrepreneur. You have an amazing life story, which is why I wanted to bring you on, because we've got a lot of aspirational young people on the show. You wrote a great book, best-selling book called Burn the Boats, which I have given out hundreds of your books to young people. And I thank you. And I love I love the book, love the messaging. I got a big stack of your books from Amazon recently at the house because uh, I like to keep a stash of them around. Uh, so tell us a little bit about Matt Higgins, and I want to go into your uh, residence at Harvard Business School. But for those of us that don't know Matt Higgins that are listening in, tell us a little bit how you got raised. Tell us a little bit that startup story that's Matt Higgins, Inc. All right. Well, well thank you, by the way, about the book. I appreciate that. It's very kind. You're a very kind, generous person, uh, Mr. Scaramucci. Well, I mean, you make me look good, brother. That's I why. appreciate it. So uh, for those who don't know, and if you do, sorry for being redundant, but I grew up in uh, Queens, New York, uh, on Springfield Boulevard, in Bayside. And there were these little garden apartments there that were rent subsidized. I think our rent was like 350 bucks a month. <clears throat> and I was raised by a single mom who was fiercely intelligent, but progressively more disabled as time went went on. She actually had a, a GD, which is relevant to the story. Uh, very, very abusive uh, childhood, which only was revealed to me after she uh, passed away. But so my, my early childhood was was basically doing whatever it would take to survive. I used to work at McDonald's on Springfield Boulevard, scraping gum under the tables and selling flowers on the corner of the highway on Mother's Day and and scalping tickets before it was legal. Just whatever it would take, uh, because uh, one of the gifts that I was given was from a very early age was a sense of like, I don't belong here. Like, I don't know how this happened. I don't know how I ended up being like transported to a Roach Motel on Springfield Boulevard, like living in dirt. But I, uh, I want a better life for my mom and for myself. And so uh, crazy, crazy background in a moment of desperation and frustration. When I realized the cavalry wasn't coming, I made a radical decision inspired by my mom, actually, which is back then, if you took your GED and you did well enough, no matter your age, and even though your class hadn't graduated yet, you could go to any college in America, kind of like the pity path. So and I was like, wait, anything? And uh, I did it. I uh, and my burn the boats move, which I can get into, is not that I dropped out of high school when I was 16 to go to college. It was that when I came up with this crazy idea, everybody tried to talk me out of it. And so my my, my revelation, which has carried, and we can get into this throughout my entire career, was that if you really want to do something bold, one, you're likely to be alone because it's bold. No one's going to agree with you. But two, you actually have to lean into self sabotage. It's counterintuitive. And so I got left back every year, sat in the same uh, homeroom for, as I call the land of misfit toys, everybody wearing beepers, dealing drugs, me slinging flowers and scalping tickets. And that gave me no choice but to go forward with my plan because I had a 55 GPA by the time I dropped out of high school. And the rest is history, Anthony. Okay. Okay. But, but there's a manifestation in your brain. Forget about school for a second, because some of us suck at school. Some of us are really good at school. 
and school can't be the defining characteristic of a success quotient. So uh, for me, you have like three or four things that are going on simultaneously. You are a gifted person in terms of observation and analysis. You're a great investor. You are a warm person and you have an open heart towards people, which is why you teach at Harvard or you're a shark on Shark Tank or you're writing a book about your life and things that you think about so that you can share it with other people. And then the third thing, uh, which is really the, the Mad Higgins inspiration for me is you know how to have fun, Higgins. Okay, you're a fun guy. You're a guy that other people want to be with. And so, so how do you go from the GPA at 55 and whatever the, the hell was going on in your life to making the transition to where you are today? So I think the simple answer, any, everyone, we've all been through crap and hell, our own versions of it. But I think when you go through hell and you come out the other side, we all have a fundamental choice. We, we sort of come into a fork in the road. Um, I, you're aware that you were denied something or subjected to something. So are you going to respond to that by denying that to, ever, to others for the rest of your life or subjecting them to that which you were subjected to? Like, I had to walk five miles to school, so you should walk five miles to school. Or... Are you going to take that experience, what you witnessed, and realize the gravity, the, the the trajectory change in your life it would have made if you were supplied that thing or not subjected to that thing? And I think I chose to say, I witnessed my mother literally die in hellish squalor when the whole world turned the back on her. She didn't need to die. Like, uh, I, w I witnessed the power of having no one care or apathy. Mm -hmm. And realize, you know what? The greatest and best use of my money, time, energy, and talent is going to be ameliorating suffering. It doesn't mean I need to be Mother Teresa, but I'm never going to forget what would have happened had somebody cared. And I'm going to use that to propel me. And otherwise known, are you going to be bitter or are you going to be generous? Right. And so, so for me, another, th another great thing I love, among the many things I love about it, no self pity. Okay. No. Life is unfair. Bad stuff's going to happen to you. Bad stuff did happen to you. But you can't have any self pity. You got to dust yourself off, and you got to go forward in your life, and and live, and dream, and manifest your life. I mean, I, you and I both been around politics. We can get into it my whole life, right? Like honestly, victim victim narrative is fool's gold being peddled by cynical people. You have two ways to get elected, right? You can go the populist route. You can go the kind of the, the route where you have no empathy for others, and, and you know you're you're cruel. You lack compassion. But I would say honestly, those who peddle the victim narrative are actually just being cynical and trying to play on on emotion when in reality it's fool's gold never doesn't leave anywhere so i have never once allowed myself to indulge in the idea that somehow i'm a victim or somehow why you know why this happened to me and i always respond to every bad thing that's happened saying why not me i mean i seem pretty well equipped to i had testicular cancer i have one testicle i have seem pretty well suited to be that guy yeah i mean you're a survivor but also you are a uh you're, you're a guy that can say you know i tell people i'm too short matt to see the glass anything other than half full when i'm looking at the glass it looks it looks full to me why why, why am i going to get myself upset all right you were just at harvard you had a, you have a residence at the harvard business school uh which is an amazing achievement in itself you've done this now for the past six years uh what do you teach them and and what do they teach you matt ah, I, I mean i i love the story of uh, this class on multiple levels because you know to go from ged to faculty at hbs as an executive fellow that when I, when this all first started, it was always a dream for me to compete, honestly, in an academic setting. And because I was taking care of my mom, I did seven years of college at night, four years of law school at night, 11 years working multiple jobs. And but to be honest, even as I say this to you, Anthony, I'm like, you're full of shit. Still an excuse. You still could have found a way to compete. Like, literally, I deny myself that could I have really competed in that environment? So I always wanted to be I have an academic part of my brain and I want to do it. And so. I pitched HBS on this idea of like, what if we created a course that breaks down the, the omni-channel journey in consumer, right? And we bring the most cutting edge companies that are not, you know, five years ago from an HBS case study, they're happening now. And we really show them what, what not only what the omni-channel looks like, but also what does it take to be a successful entrepreneur from every angle? Long story short, uh, over the course of that week, to answer your question, what do we teach? We teach what does it take to scale a business using DTC and e-com? What does it take 
to withstand the challenges in this fundraising environment where the private equities close. Like we show it from every angle, but what makes the class truly magic is the fact that a lot of the case studies you get at any a business school, you know this, are like businesses that aren't quite relevant anymore. I mean, I'm gonna throw out like the gap or something, you know, it's like fine company, but nobody cares. And so this year I brought the CEO of Shopify, Harley Finkelstein, we brought Olipop for those who know about it. It's probiotic drinks. Like it's, it's athletic greens, Cat Cole, the CEO came up. So these awesome cutting edge businesses, but the part that I'm proudest of is that it takes place over a week and it's like, it's, it's, it's unrelenting schedule, but by the end of it, it really reveals the journey from beginning to end, you know, that you really just wouldn't get in a business school environment. What do you learn from these kids though, Matt, you walk out of class enlightened by something. What is it? Such a great question. The, the thing I learned the first year, and then I still am surprised. Coming, you went to Harvard, so it's a little bit different, right? But coming from where I sit on the outside looking in, I would think that somebody who makes its way their way all the way to Harvard can now take a deep breath and say, "My downside has been de-risked, right? Like there's there's now you know a floor. Uh, I'm going to make six figures. Like uh, I have prestige, right? And when I finished the first year, and it was amazing, and I went back to do a lot of career counseling. I realized that whether you're talking to a kid at Queens College like I went to or a kid at Harvard University, they have the same fear, the same sense of imposter syndrome, the feeling that I don't belong here. I don't know how I got here. There is not an ounce of them that feels like their life has been de-risked. And I love that because it just reveals the shared journey that we're all on and how easy it is to judge somebody else. Somebody asked me this question. Hey, Matt, like, because you didn't go to Harvard, like, do you just toss away those resumes and look for the kid from Queens College? And I'm like, absolutely not. What it takes to go to that institution, anyone sitting in that room has their own troubles and idiosyncrasies that are just as large to them as whatever it is that I dealt with. So long way of answering, Tony, I love the humanity of connecting with people that I would have thought would have felt like they got everything ahead of them and they're just as fragile as uh, anyone else. Well, I mean, I, I mean, I, 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 lo I love, I love the sentiment there. I think the thing that I found when I was there, Ross Perot, you may remember Ross. He, of course, Ross came out the great he, Tuesday commercial that he ran, the inf the thirty minute infomercial. Right, exactly. Uh, and he was also he ran for president, but he was also a very famous entrepreneur, an American billionaire when billions were really a lot of money. Pulled twenty percent um, as an independent. Right? Pulled twenty percent as an independent. He had a lot of a lot of truths in what he was saying. Uh, he came to speak at Harvard Business School in 1987. I was over at the law school, and so I crossed the river, and I went into the amphitheater to hear him speak. And he left me with something I'll never forget. He said, you guys, I feel sorry for you guys. And I said, Ross, well, what the hell does he mean? He goes, you're going to Harvard. So now you're not going to take any risk. You're going to go to McKinsey and Goldman Sachs and Ernst and & Young. Uh, but some of you are real dreamers and entrepreneurs, but because you went to Harvard, you're going to fear failure and you're going to try to land yourself someplace so that you don't have Harvard be your crowning achievement. And his point was embrace the suck, go out there and fail at a few things. And I took it to heart. Of course, I went out and failed at many, many things, Matt. No, but that's a brilliant insight. I talk about that a lot too, that yeah. it's very important the more successful you become, you define your needs as narrowly as possible. They must be moving in opposition. What do I need? What do I got? Because what you got does become a prison. It's what makes people totally risk adverse. I'm always meditating like I need my wife, I need my kids, I need my sustenance. But other than that, I don't need anything else. It's such great, 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 brilliant advice because when I what I love about my course in particular, when I start... You know, the room is full of future McKin McKinsey consultants and fewer and a Bain. And by the end, they've lost a couple of people. And then, and again, nothing wrong with going that route, but it reawakens the dream and makes people feel like they I know, listen, I, I want people to reach their dreams. My roommate from Harvard Law School, he was literally a Goldman Sachs banker. Like if he was in a box, like a Ken doll, you know what I mean? If you pulled him off the shelf and you opened up the box, he was the prototype of a Goldman Sachs banker and God bless him. He had a great career there. He went on to become a partner there. He, he did phenomenally well from a wealth point of view. He just wasn't an entrepreneur. Uh, and you don't need to be, you need to be who you are and comfortable in your own skin. Did you ever practice law? I don't even know if I, I know did. That. No, I didn't practice law. No, I actually failed the bar, which freaked out my mother. And then I had to go take it again, but I didn't even need it, but I did it to shut my mother up. And then there was one day 
I was in Rosano's Deli in Port Washington, which is where I grew up. And Mrs. Capianco turned to me and said, how's that law firm Goldman and Sachs that you're working at? I said, excuse me? Yeah, your mother says you're a lawyer at Goldman and Sachs. And I'm like, my mother, okay? My mother was embarrassed that I was working at Goldman. That's amazing. Okay? She was embarrassed. She wanted me to be a lawyer. What the hell's wrong with you? What is this Goldman and Sachs? Okay, and that's how I grew up. I mean, no one, I mean, my mother thought I was going to Harford Law School for the first two years. She had no idea where the hell it was and didn't care. So, you know, you know I never, I never took the bar because I, uh, I never wanted to, you know, I never wanted that to be my fallback plan once I decided I was never going to be a lawyer. Well, we're going to get to burn the boat yeah. in a second because I think that's really important. But I want to go to some of your tweets because I'm a big follower of Matt Higgins on now called X, but I guess we can still use the uh, verb tweet. Um, By the way, you and I were debate, talking when you first joined years ago. We were, you know, like, should we embrace it? I don't know if you remember. You probably don't. But it was do. many, many years ago when you first started. I but do. all right, what are you going to throw back at me? No, what did 2009, I? you told me to get, get, get on the bus. Um, no, I mean, you, you, you have these great tweets. I'm, I picked out a few of them. Your 2024 Contrarian Guide to <laughs> Wealth Creation. Okay, people should follow you. What's your handle on X? M. Higgins. M. Higgins. So people should certainly follow you. But myth one, all debt is bad. Pay it off. That's a myth? 100% a myth. Yeah, tell clickbait. Me why. It's clickbait. Because let's use real estate as the prime example. Real estate is, is, is basically one of the only ways that anyone who's not you know rich and got a relationship with a bank can get leverage, right? And non-recourse leverage, right? And so the ability to go ahead and control, let's just use numbers of a million dollar asset and put down 20, 20%. And get the appreciation on that asset, which historically real estate appreciates at four plus percent. So I think telling people, you know, all debt is bad is very bad because when I look around, a lot of people that I grew up with who have made some really terrible decisions for some people who did OK, it's because they bought a piece of property early on in their life. And as you know, the rule is 72, right? Simply take that interest rate divided by 72 and 15 years from now, that property doubles. And so I, I just am a big believer that not all debt is bad. I, I didn't pay off my student loans for like decades because they were locked in at like 2%. So why would, why would I pay that back when I can get a better return with that money? I think it's great. I think it's a great lesson. That's why I brought it up. Let's talk about making money in up or down markets. Give us some advice there. Uh, you've been uncanny at being able to do that. A lot of people get scared when the market's crashing. Yeah, I think. What I mean, say I, you about this? I, I, I'm I'm a firm believer that uh, the uh, enemy of wealth creation is diversification, and that at the that really successful people t try to consolidate their bets and they dilute their doubt by cultivating their conviction. What's it going to take for me to believe more strongly in the thing I believe in? How do I pressure test it? And so I think the way to make money in, in up or down markets is to have you know, a few central themes that you really believe in that are backed by tailwinds that can blow stronger than the headwinds, right? And that you don't have to be specifically right to be right overall. In other words, it's like you're betting on a, on a company that is getting the benefit of the tailwind. And even if it doesn't work out perfectly, you're still going to do okay. So let's use NVIDIA as an example. I was pretty early on NVIDIA relatively. And it's only because I talked to people all day long. And I would talk to folks who understood AI much better than Anthony or I do. And I was like, who has pricing power? Who's the plumbing of AI? And the answer was always NVIDIA, NVIDIA, these chips. And so, you know, I went hard on it. Same thing with GLP-1 drugs. You know, we all have these little insights that are gold and we dismiss them because maybe we're not professional money managers. My mother died of obesity. I watched her unable to escape the vortex of obesity. She eventually died from pulmonary thrombosis, sitting in a chair, throwing blood clots. So I understood if you could if you could if you could reverse obesity, all these other conditions that that go along with it, you could change society. And when GLP-1 drugs started on the market, I went, I would spend endless hours researching Lily in particular with Manjaro and all this. Stuff. And then I concentrated my portfolio. So at any one period of time, I am concentrating 75% of all my assets in three stocks. And that is how I do well. And number two, I don't. Wonder, refer you, can I ask you the three stocks? Do you mind? We got a I, lot just, of I, I just gave you two as in, yeah. I've been in NVIDIA. L Lily, I've, NVIDIA. What else? I've been literally in NVIDIA and Microsoft. Microsoft. Been like, you know, and that's like obvious. But the other thing, Tony, I do is uh, which to get into it a bit is like 
I, there's two forms of conventional wisdom that are both true, but that don't tell the full story. Uh, you know, put your money in an index and it'll outperform a money manager, right? Because, you know, they just put it in a spider uh, or give your money to a, you know, a money manager because they're going to make sure you don't make stupid decisions. I actually think you could beat both the money manager and the market and index by being an active custodian of your assets. And by, because no one is going to care more than you about, you know, on any given day, you know, how to manage your money. And so, for example, I love derivatives. I love writing cover calls. I write lighting. I love puts. You know, nobody who's managed my money is going to bother making three or four transactions a day. But I can go ahead and, and squeeze out some alpha by, by actively manage my money. Okay. So just for some of the young listeners, a, yes. covered, a covered call is you own the stock and now you're writing a call contract at a higher price. So you're covered, meaning worst thing that can happen to you is they bought the stock at 50. You write the option at 65. The stock moves to 65. You're a natural seller there. And of course, if the stock doesn't get there, you've collected this call premium and you've added it to your overall return. Right. So it's a great strategy when you are fundamentally long something. You know, people will say that's a mildly bearish you know, view because you're capping your ups. I actually don't believe that's the case because you can do something called roll the call. You can go further out, collect some additional premium, you know, move the strike price mm -hmm. up. But it's a perfect example. If you're long, let's just say Microsoft to keep it simple, right? And your your money manager has put you in Microsoft and you got you know $100,000 in that stock. They're not going to sit there and say, hey, Matt, let's write some covered calls on Microsoft. And they're not going to manage the strike price and because it's not worth the time, but it's worth the time for you. So, so right. you did a great job explaining it to anyone young who doesn't quite get it. The easiest thing is just make sure you pay attention to call to uh, option strategy around your money. Okay, well, let me ask you this. this is a little bit of a risky thing. It's called selling a put. And so you like a stock. Uh, let's say the stock is at 50, um, and, but you sell a put at 40 because now you, you're willing to buy it at 40. And of course, the stock doesn't get there. You've collected the premium on the other end. So there's a covered call, but also selling a put. But selling puts are risky because if, if the stock gets hit at 40 and it heads down to 30, you've lost some money. What do you think about selling puts? I love that we're talking about this. Well, I love selling puts. I think there's ways to minimize the risk. Number one is try to back very, very large cap companies. You're not going to get paid the same premium because they're not as volatile. But ideally, you have some built-in protection of black swan events. Number two, when you're selling puts, avoid catalysts, avoid earnings, avoid anything that you think could you know, trigger a big move. Number three, and this is complicated, but you can go ahead and sell a put spread. You know what I mean? Buy a put spread rather. So you can, as Tony said, uh, you can you can rather sell a put spread. You can sell at you know five thirty, but you can buy at five hundred just in case there's a black swan event. You could be you could protect your downside. But right, so I you're taking in some premium, but you're giving up some premium to protect your downside. So so these are things. But you know, I love just to say with that, I love put writing even more than call writing because the market goes up over time. And so you have the gravity, the gravity of the market eventually mm -hmm. by your side, but you have to be really careful. Where young people screw up, and anybody listening to this can probably relate, is you chew, you chase premium, uh, and you want to get that great premium, and you don't realize well that premium is coming to you because of the volatility of the stock and the risk and, and the, the risk. risk. So if you're going to play the game of calls or puts, I think you do great blue chip stocks that have you know significant market cap. And you avoid catalysts, and uh, and you could generate decent return. All right, this is very very helpful. We're going to take some questions from the audience. Some of this stuff is brewing up. Why don't we start with some of the emails that have come in, and uh, and then we'll go to burning the boats. That mentality. If the Fed cuts rates without taming inflation, which raising rates was never meant to do, how is the how is that possibly good for the economy or the average consumer? What do you think? I want to hear your first uh, reaction. Um, well, I actually think the Fed is is uh, is raised the rates to try to tame the inflation. I'm not necessarily saying it worked, but I think that they have an ancient playbook of raising rates to slow down the economy and and tame inflation. Um, and I would say that uh, cutting the rates at this point is probably a good idea because I think we are tipping over now. And the worst thing that the Fed can have is deflation. God forbid you get in a situation in this debt-laden environment 
where you have to repay dollars with dollars that are worth more than the ones that you borrowed. The only way you can live in a debt laden environment, unfortunately, is with some level of inflation. You've got to monetize the debt and pay the debt back with dollars that are worth less than the ones that you borrowed. Fed has been doing that now for 150 years since its inception in 1913. So let's call it 111 years. Uh, what's your opinion? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I like the wording of the question because you're you're zeroing in on the reality. The Fed's target was two percent inflation, right? So I actually thought there would have been more political pressure on the Fed Fed to walk away from that goal. If you read, you know, especially Financial Times, read out of Europe, there's a lot a lot of debate whether that should even be the goal, two percent. But setting that aside, what what camp am I am I in? I'm not convinced we're going to have nearly as many rate cuts this year. I'm not convinced that the Fed is going to conclude that the war against inflation is up. Because, you know, we're defying a lot of forces that we had assumed were fixed. You know what I mean? And so one of them is if the Fed were to bring inflation down to 2%, unemployment would end up north of 5%. There's a ton of papers from economists that tie those two things together. And yet we haven't seen the uptick in unemployment, which makes me uh, believe that, that the war against inflation isn't necessarily over. But regardless of that conclusion, I'm not sure the Fed will be cutting rates in the first half of this year at all. And that's what's interesting about this market. I think first it baked in that we're going to have a cut in March. That's reset without getting the reset in the market, which I found fascinating. I thought the market would have corrected based upon the change in that percent. But, but you got better GDP growth numbers, which means you're going to have better earnings. So that, you, so that kind of makes sense. But we were for a while, the market was running based on rate expectations, right? Rate, uh, you know, last uh, December, right? But now it's running based upon the health of the economy. But if the economy is that strong, that means we may not have gotten inflation under control and rates won't be when we go down. But to ask your question, how is it good for the consumer? As Anthony mentioned, he's exactly right, right? You, 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 uh, you increase rates that basically tamps down investment and spending and eventually things reset, right? Uh, how it's good for the consumer is eventually it's going to, sh the, the inability to get debt to take on uh, capital is going to show up in job creation. It's going to show up. Like if you talk to any small business out there, medium-sized business, nobody can get capital to invest. If you can't get capital, you can't invest. You can't buy a new store. Let's say you have two coffee shops. You want to get a third. Yeah, but now your carrying cost of that debt's too high to make it worthwhile to build it out. Now you're not hiring the contractor. Now you're not hiring the barista. That must show up. So I still think we're living in on the contrails of stimulus, of that $5 trillion in stimulus that hasn't finished working its way out through the system. So I feel I'm, I'm not at all convinced that the Fed is going to be cutting rates this first half of this year. So Steve is uh, coming in there. Steve and Mix, Fed not cutting rates at all would be a big shift in market expectations. So let's just play the contrarian game a little. So I think they're cutting rates. And you think when do you think they're cutting rates? Well, now? I think I think certainly by the uh, the middle of the year, you'll see at least one rate cut. And so, I think um, we're almost saying the same thing. I'm saying it's yeah. not to the second half. I'm not sure how many cuts. The yeah, I, I, think like cut, I think they cut steeply going into the election. And uh, I think that uh, if Alan Greenspan could be accused of hurting George Herbert Walker Bush in 1992 by raising rates into the election. I think Jerome Powell is going to help President Biden by cutting those rates and he'll find reasons to cut the rates. And so uh, that's my feeling there. So, Stephen, I appreciate you bringing that up. Uh, let's go to the next one. I believe the market will top by the end of February. What do you think? It's a call from Long Island. I have a soft spot for a Long Island call because that's where I spend 90 percent of my life. Uh, market going to top in February? Or this good year for the market. Well, I'll just repeat. I'll just repeat the prediction I had made since I put it out on Twitter anyway. That the market would uh, would uh, would correct ten percent from whatever was the high going into the end of twenty twenty three. I still believe, and I said that it would happen by within the first eight months of this year. So I, I, so I don't know. Where, where do we end the year? Then we end the year higher or lower than the start of the year? I think we end the year lower than the start of the year. It's interesting. Okay, yeah, so I'm more, I'm more in the J.P. Morgan category. I think they're the most bearish on on mm -hmm. the prediction. I think we end a year lower. So there you go. So Carl, that's a opinion. Full disclosure, though, I have a bunch of uh, S&P puts, so uh, I'm shopping my book. But that's my view. Right. That's interesting because it, it's against the 125 year stock almanac analysis of presidential years. 
Uh, and so, uh, but a big shout out. Uh, from, so is 91 indictments, you know, so I'm just kind of throwing yeah, it all out the window. You know, it's out there, yeah. 90, uh, you know, four, 91 counts, four big indictments. Yeah, I also think it's, you know, it's interesting. We, we have the pand pandemic behind us, right? So it's hard to, it's hard to keep that into focus that that was a hundred year event. And when you have hundred year events, right? That that ends up distorting distorting all the other factors. The whole reason why the world is not behaving and the economy and the market aren't behaving is because of the injection of five million, five trillion of stimulus. So like you can't, even though that seems like it's in the rearview mirror, it's right alongside us right now, well, affecting everything. People saved it. A lot of people put it in their uh, savings accounts. Right, which is hard for most people to believe. Like, how could there still be five hundred billion left in the accounts? So I was like, well, well, there is. Let's go to the next one. Yeah. How and how much do our U.S. proxy wars contribute to inflation, world inflation? Esteban from New Mexico. That's a great question. I don't know, Anthony. You go first. I don't have a very brilliant answer to that. I, I would. I don't think. I don't think it's that significant. But Higgins is like a typical politician. That's on. He's passing the buck to me. Yeah. Uh, hoping that I flub the question, then he can come in with his exactly erudite brilliance. Um, and I, I think the proxy wars contribute a lot to the inflation, frankly, because when you are having proxy wars, you are expanding your uh, military and you're printing more dollars. And let's just face it, U.S. is monetizing its debt through inflation. It's also uh, printing dollars that's being bought by the Fed and where the Fed is carrying a lot of our own debt on its balance sheet. And so that is coming from all of these outside entanglements among it, everything else. World inflation. Why don't we have you take the world inflation? Oh, how does how does it contribute to what definitely contributes to world inflation from food prices uh, to, you know, to, I mean, oil hasn't showed up to the fullest extent, but no, it definitely contributes. I think Ukraine is the mother of all proxy wars, though, right? I mean, you know, do I think generically intervention in other places it contributes to inflation to the same extent no but but ukraine is an entirely different animal so yeah it hurt, hurt the energy markets hurt the supply chain in europe it put germany into a recession uh you know i mean the the russians are saying they're growing the economy but that's after it imploded yeah you know, so if you go if you go down 30 and then you go up five i don't know you're having a great economy it doesn't seem like they're having a great economy no one is winning uh when there's a war all right let's take another question what happens to the mining stocks this year with the having of Bitcoin? That's interesting. What do you think? That's more your area. This is Diana from California. So I, Hi, think, Diana. I think the mining stocks are going up, Diana. I think what ends up happening is as they mine Bitcoin and the program of Bitcoin cuts the uh, issuance of Bitcoin. And just for people that don't know what I'm talking about, the Bitcoin network is spitting out 900 coins a day. Uh, sometime mid to late April, uh, it will get cut in half. There's a four-year halving cycle, and it'll get cut in half when they reach a certain block issuance, uh, and they'll go from 900 to 450 a day. Uh, and so some people think that's going to hurt the mining stocks because it's going to be harder to mine Bitcoin, but I don't think it hurts the mining stocks. It's going to push the price up. You have two things pushing the price of Bitcoin up. Uh, the ETFs, which have now been sanctioned by the SEC, uh, we have our friend Larry Fink working for Bitcoin right now. Uh, I say that somewhat facetiously, but he's got over $2 billion in the iBit ETF. And so no one's asking me, but I'll say it anyway. I think we go through the all-time high of Bitcoin, which is 69000 plus uh, by the end of the year, if not more than that. And that'll be very good for the mining stocks. What say, you, what say you, Mr. Blockchain? I, I, I completely agree with you. I think what, what's amazing about Bitcoin is that it's um, it's crossed over into an institutionalized asset that isn't going anywhere uh, for the foreseeable future, which uh, is interesting on a number of fronts, because if you believe that we've crossed over into adoption, that it's here to stay, it's institutionalized, it's part of society. Now you can zero in on the deflationary aspect of, 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 uh, of Bitcoin, and that gives you some assurance of the direction it's going to. So actually Bitcoin now, I regret it because I'm stupidly lost faith in it after being so early. I used to mine Bitcoin you know, in 2013, and then I, I lost faith uh, and I've done a 180 again on it. But because of that, because of the nature of it, because there's only going to be 21 million of them, uh, because of the fact that, you know, it's crossed over, uh, you can play that in a lot of ways with a degree of confidence if you believe it. And I happen to believe it. So, Anthony, I don't know. 
if you follow Bido, but I love Bido. Mm -hmm. I'm always, I'm always at any one moment, I'm always selling puts on Bido and selling calls 10% of the money. When Bitcoin goes up, then I pull up the puts. The reason why puts, as Anthony said before, can be very dangerous is because a black swan event, the thing could drop. But if you believe that Bitcoin has this inevitable, uh, you know, growth, which I do, then you can be a little more confident on puts because then you could chase it down, knowing that it'll recover. So, anyway, that's how I relate to Bitcoin. I don't own any Bitcoin. I just I just play uh, Bitcoin constantly with just, my. Just be long term and don't look at it day to day. That's what I would say. Let's take another question. Uh, use debt to make investments in the crypto space. Recent events caused liquidation, and now I'm upside down. Impossible to meet debt service, taking personal hits on credit worthiness, and so. Uh, you want to take that one? You're the crisis manager here. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I'm really sorry, Mark. I mean, uh, we all made very well. All those who were involved made some terrible, cringeworthy decisions. I personally made some terrible decisions, and I, I'm shocked by them. Whether it buying NFTs that were ridiculous, like there was a degree where we all, I think, all lost our our our, our judgment. I would say to you, number one, it takes time to rebuild your your credit and just slow and steady. The most important thing you need to protect, to protect is your self-esteem and your worth. What happens is I think actually the greatest destruction of somebody has made decisions like you did. You start feeling you lose your confidence in yourself. And so I'm sharing with you that without going to specifics, uh, that I made a range of terrible decisions like you did using using debt. So number one, don't ever do that again. <laughs> you know, you always want to manage uh, your, 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 uh, your debt capacity. And honestly, as somebody who's rebuilt their credit multiple times in my life, especially when I was younger, eventually you will you will turn it around. And then three, every cry from every crisis uh, births an opportunity even greater than that which was taken from you. So what do I mean by that is, for example, I'm about to launch a company uh, in in two months, and the uh, it's a blockchain native uh, cybersecurity company. And if I had never made terrible decisions in crypto, I would never have understood the need for a cybersecurity company that goes way beyond audits. And that's what I'm working on, right? You and your bad decisions, using too much debt and whatnot, like you probably learned something that's very valuable. So don't walk away from it. Figure out what, what did I learn here that I can profit from in the future? And that's how I approach every crisis and every time I emerge with something even greater than that, which was taken from me. All right. I mean, it's well said. Uh, we, we, either we either win, win or learn. Yeah, the, you could have saved a lot of soul. We but, either yeah. win or learn. Yeah. Amen. That is a really good statement. Uh, all right, let's see if there's any more questions since the economy numbers look so healthy. Why would the Fed cut rates? And I think it's to what Anthony said. They would cut rates because they're seeing other other, uh, other signals that show that we are on, they're on the other side and they don't want to be behind, they want to be ahead. If they, there's an argument to be said, if you wait, obviously, for you know all the signals to be right in front of you, it's too late. So that's why they would. I'm not convinced that that is actually the case, though. I think that unemployment was a key mover that you wanted to see move, and it didn't. And so I don't know where all this conjecture comes from that the, we're going to get five rate cuts this year. But you're asking exactly the right question. And the only reason they would is because they have a belief that it, uh, they've already achieved their goals or well on their way to achieving their goals. All right. So, I mean, it's another great answer. We, we're, we're, uh, I'm watching the time go by here. We're going to... Uh, uh, we're going to, you know, we're going to draw to a close in a second. But before we do, I want to talk about the book, Burn the Boats. And I want to talk about the mantra of boat burning. Uh, we have one quick, uh, what happens? I think we got that one already. So let's keep going. But talk about burn the boats. It's a phenomenal concept. What does burn the boats mean, by the way? Obviously, I know because I've read the okay. book. Right. Well, I'll, give the, I'll give the quick what history. What burn the boats means and tell them why you are a boat burner. Okay. All right, youngins. I should a little bit of history lesson. So as I mentioned before, every society has this phrase, but all the way going back to uh, uh, 500 uh, BC, uh, the art of war, this idea, this phrase, burn the boat, shows up in different languages. And so burn the boat the boats literally means eliminating any means of retreat. I actually, this phrase can be a little bit jingoistic, and often used in a very bombastic way, like burn the boats and I don't care what anyone thinks. You know, you know, I felt like I was the run to write this book because as you'll see, if you read it, I talk openly about the shame I had from growing up poor and all this baggage that I would carry, anxiety, imposter syndrome, the first time I was on Shark Tank feeling out of my depth. I wanted to write a book for those people 
for, to whom risk does not come naturally. And I think a lot of people self-select out of ambition because they label themselves, I'm not a risk taker. And reality is we're all risk wanters. And so we just don't know how to reframe our relationship with risk. Burn the boats is an attempt to appropriate this phrase on behalf of the angst laden and the anxiety ridden to teach you how to change your relationship with risk so that you can fully commit. And now why is that so important? Studies show, science shows, I talk about in the book, merely contemplating a plan B while you're pursuing plan A, the energy leakage from thinking about there's another way uh, is the very reason why you end up needing a backup plan. It's such an insidious thought, but so counterintuitive. What you need to do is process the worst case scenario before you undertake a big goal. Number two, decide what would I do if it were to happen? We all have hardwired into our primitive factory settings, a backup plan. What's the likelihood that the worst thing is going to happen? Very low. And three, what, four rather, what pain would you endure to achieve your goal? When you lay it all out like that before you take on something hard, then you move in one direction. You burn the boats and you're not afraid because you know that you've taken care of the details. Most people fail to litigate the risk before they do something scary. And then they're always looking over their shoulder and looking over the shoulder. So in my book, I share like 50 different case studies from people of all walks of life, Rex Ryan, Scarlett Johansson, an amazing paraplegic in Canada, all of whom had to burn some kind of boat before they could achieve uh, the impossible. All right, listen, it's a phenomenal book. I think it's it, it's got to be one of the best entrepreneurial books I've ever read. Certainly oh, the best of 2020. Tony, did I tell you about my tattoo really quick? Which uh, I wish Please I had. Tell me you don't have a Luna tattoo. I wish I could. I, I, I no, no. I, I was only. I was a week away from getting that. No, okay, yeah, I, I, me, it says. Uh, it looks like a like a whole gang sleeve, but it's down my right arm, and it's a uh, Pofu Chenjo, which is burn the boats effectively in uh, Chinese. So that's my tattoo. All right. Well, you know, when when you are a Sports Illustrated bathing suit model, because they are switching up and adding a lot of diversity to that, uh, <laughs> I'll, make sure, I'll make sure I get a picture of that. I'll make sure I get the. I make sure I get the negative so I can burn the negative. By the way, you just turned 60. I'm 49. Who ran into each other at 6 a.m. at the gym in Dubai without even knowing we're in the Abu Dhabi, without even Amen. knowing the same Amen. building? Four seasons. We were hustling. We got to hustle. You got to stay Got to stay in the gym. You know that, and I know that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Matt Higgins, a brilliant entrepreneur, a uh, shark on Shark Tank, but also an incredible person, an inspirational person. Next week, we have the legendary economist Lynn Alden that wrote writes about our broken money system. I'm a huge fan of hers, and she's obviously a Bitcoiner. Uh, and Mark saying loves the conversation. Uh, can't Thank wait you, for the next one. We'll get the book. Thank you, Mark. You hang in there, man. Yeah, you'll, you'll be all right, my friend. You'll, you'll figure it out, my brother. We yeah. all do. You will figure yeah. it out. Just hang in there. All right, Matthew, thank you. Uh, and I'm going to root for your Detroit Lions now that you brought that up. <laughs> You're the best, Anthony. We'll see what happens this weekend. God Thank bless you, so man. Much. Great Bye, weekend, everybody. All right, take care. Root you out until next week.